Let's read uh, Daniel uh, chapter number one. We'll go one through eight. The word of God says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake to Ashpenaz, uh, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful and all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding uh, science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king." Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, uh, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And then verse number nine, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Uh, Daniel is a wonderful character in the Bible, a very interesting character. Some background here, Daniel was born and lived in the sixth century uh, BC. Now when we think of the sixth century, for those of you, any history nerds in here? All right, so me and Bob. So to me and Bob, when we think of ancient times like that, the 6th century was very eventful. Uh, during the 6th century, that's when the Greeks were building their great Acropolis. During the 6th century, that's when the Mayans started really flourishing in Mexico all the way at that time. Uh, if you go back, I believe the Phoenicians were, the, were during the 6th century, made the first round trip all the way around Africa. And interestingly enough, Confucius and Buddha, they were alive during the 6th century too. It was a, a lot of, it was a time when a lot of things were happening. But in the Middle East, in that part of the world, the 6th century was a very scary time for the Jewish people. When you study this, King, uh, actually Pharaoh, King of Egypt, if you will, he invaded Babylon or modern day Iraq, if you can get that in your mind. And he was soundly defeated and he was routed. And basically he was chased, Pharaoh was all the way back to, the, uh, to Sinai from, from uh, Iraq. And during that time, when Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who was a prince at that time, or we can call him king just for sake of the story, that during that time, Nebuchadnezzar was chasing them all the way back down. They went through Israel, they went through Judah, and they basically, in a cleanup advance, wiped out all their armies, sacked Jerusalem, and they carried all the people away back as prisoners or deported them. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, if you study him, he was a very, very disgustingly wicked man. We know from the story that when he invaded Jerusalem, he took all of the holy things that were set apart for God's worship, and he put them in a pagan temple for his, to basically say that his God had won. So he, he brought those things back to Babylon, put the holy things in a terrible place. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was also a man who didn't just steal the holy things from Judah. You know what he also did? He stole the bright, shining lights of their future. Here's, here's a man who knew how to really subjugate people. He took their children, anywhere from 13 to 17 years old, murdered their families, destroyed where they lived, put them in bondage, and carried them all the way from Israel to Iraq. He knew, he was a very, he was a very wise man, but he was also a very disgusting man who knew, I'm going to send them a message. You don't rise up against me, I have your children. That's who we're talking about. That Out of that story, you have Daniel. 
So if you can imagine, you've got this long train of 13 to 17 year olds. And number one, can you imagine how scary that was to be 13 to 17 years old, to have a foreign army come in, kill your parents, kill your brothers and sisters, chain you up and take you to a foreign land where you don't know the food, you don't know the culture, you don't speak the language. And now all of a sudden you're thrown into a program and you have to succeed. Out of that journey from uh, Israel to Iraq, we meet Daniel. And we meet his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These three boys are placed into a three-year rigorous training program in Babylonian government. Think about this. Their former identities are removed. So not only did they suffer the injustice of murder, of being stolen away, but the king and the government has now taken their identities. He removes their names and gives them new names. Daniel, whose name in Hebrew means God is my judge, is now Belshazzar or Bel's, he, he, Bel's prince. Bel was a, was a pagan deity. Hananiah, whose name means beloved of the Lord, is now Shadrach or illumined by the sun god. Mishael, whose name means who is as God, is now Meshach, who is like Venus. Who would have punched in the face, right? Azariah, whose name means the Lord is my help, is now Abednego, or servant of the god Nego. Their entire lives have been upended. You know, they, ha they are forced to learn a new language. They're expected to excel in all their Babylonian education and training. Because here's, here's what I believe Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do. He's trying to totally indoctrinate them. He removes their name, he kills their family, he removes them from where they're from, and he, he's trying to get these Hebrew boys to leave their culture and to leave their God. Now you're Babylonian. Forget that you're Jews. You're Babylonian in what you eat. You're Babylonian in how you speak, how you think, how you do math. You're Babylonians. You're no longer Jews. A 13-year-old, a 14-year-old. And yet you have somebody with the courage like Daniel to step up and say, I've purposed in my heart, I'm going to do right. I've purposed. And think about what he came from. He was in a place where you had to conform or die. But Daniel rises and purposes in his heart to do right. Daniel refused to leave behind his God and his heritage. Daniel, my friends, took a stand. He purposed in his heart no matter what you can kill my family you can steal me away from friends and family and culture and language you can put me in the most strenuous program that basically if you fail i believe you'd probably be thrown out or killed right and he's put in this horrible program and yet god blesses him because he decides i'm going to take a stand i'm going to do right when we read this story here here's here's the temptation for christians we've read our bible we know this story, and sometimes it's black ink on white paper, but I want you to understand these are real people. These are real emotions. This is a real stand. You catch what I'm saying tonight or this, this afternoon? And I got to thinking about Daniel purposing in his heart, and with God's help, I want to preach on that. I want to preach on the title of my message is taken from our text. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll get started. Lord, as we uh, break into your word tonight, God, I pray that you would, Lord, use your spirit to illuminate uh, your word. Help us to understand the lessons from the scriptures. And God, I pray that you would change us. God, that you would reinforce, um, Lord, our strength. God, that you would give us the wisdom we need to be what we should be. God, I pray that you'd be with us tonight and that you would work in this service. And if there's anybody here who does not know Christ as Savior, Lord, that you'd even now begin to draw them and work in their hearts. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I think about Daniel purposing in his heart, I have three things to tell you today for those of you taking notes. Number one, I believe when Daniel purposed, here's what he purposed. I, number one, I will not sin against my God. Number one, I will not sin against my God. You know, the Bible tells us that Daniel and his friends were appointed a portion of the king's wine and meat. Now, to the average reader, I think sometimes we, we skip over that and just say, good, teenage boys are given food. Great. You know, they're going to eat everything given to them, right? But the significance of this thing was really amazing. In the ancient world, this was an incredible benefit. In the ancient world, to eat from the king's table meant that you were favored by the king. It was seen as a great honor to have the same food prepared for the king. 
we must also know that there was a huge difference, okay, between what the elites ate and what the common folk ate. If I could put it in common day vernacular, okay, I like the dollar menu at McDonald's. Can't have it anymore, but I, you know, I look back fondly on it. Oh, amen. And then I, I look back at, and you know, we've all, I think, once or twice or maybe once a week have gone and, and partaken of the said dollar menu, and it's, it's, it's okay, but it's not the best quality, right? It's good. It'll fill you up, but Daniel went from eating at the dollar menu to going to Ruth Chris's steakhouse every night. For, for, I'm talking about like royal cuts of the best prime steaks you've ever had in your life, the best food, the best wine. He literally had the, the food that the rich of the rich, the most entitled of the entitled, the king had, and he got a portion of that. That is what the temptation was. That, 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 that portion was placed across his table. And Daniel and his friends are, are now looking at this. But, but why didn't Daniel want to eat what was prepared for him? I'd like to explain a couple of things. Number one, for those of you who have any Jewish friends or know really anything about Judaism, the Babylonians ate pig. I love pig. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm a Gentile because I enjoy me some pig. Amen. <laughs> but in, in that day to be a Jew, you do not eat, you did not eat pig. You know, I like catfish and you all like catfish, fry up some catfish. Hallelujah. With some hush puppies. Glory to God. You know, I like me some catfish, but that was an unclean fish because of the scale issue, right? So the Babylonians ate pig, they ate certain kinds of fish that Jews couldn't eat, and Daniel would look, would looked at the, the quality and the type of meat and did not want to defile himself. He didn't want to go against the dietary laws for the Jews that were given in the law of Moses and Leviticus. Their meats were unclean. Well, okay, well, maybe you say, well, okay, what if he didn't eat pig? What about if he decided, you know, hey, listen, he requested to the prince of the eunuchs, can I just have beef? <laughs> right? Can I just have chicken? Can I, can I just have lamb? You know, there's another reason why I don't believe he ate it too, because the way that they prepared their meat wasn't kosher at all. When the Jews would prepare their food, here's what they would do that make them kind of different. They would completely drain the animal of its blood and then they would cook it. But the ancient Babylonians are like, a little bit of blood, it's good for me, you know? And they would eat it, and to the ancient world, that was fine. But to the Jews, in their dietary laws, that wasn't kosher, if you've heard that word before. They, that wasn't clean to them, and Daniel was looking at that and says, even if I got the best kind of meat that I could eat, it's still not clean in the way you guys prepared it, so I can't eat it like that. Daniel looked and said he didn't want to defile himself. That word defile carries the idea of polluting or straining. So, or staining, excuse me. God, I don't want to sin against your revealed word. And here's what I believe Daniel was trying to do. God, I just want to, I want to follow your commandments. Have you ever been in a time or season of your life where you just said, Lord, I just want to obey you. Lord, I want to follow your word. Christians, I hope we've gotten to a point like that. And I, and I want to remind you, if you're not there, get to that point today. Amen. Amen. But there's also a re another reason. He thought the food would pollute him. You know, and here's, here's kind of the crux, I think, of everything. In the ancient world, you know what pagans would do before they would eat? You know, we say grace. You know what they would do? They would take a portion of their wine, a portion of their meat, and they would basically offer it to idols. You've heard of this in the Bible before, meat offered to idols. Jews couldn't do it because it was wicked, right? Like, we, don't, we serve the one true God. We're not eating meat offered to idols, right? And that even was a problem in the New Testament for those of you who've read Paul's uh, epistles, right? Him addressing that. So Daniel is looking at this, but you know what Nebuchadnezzar would do? Nebuchadnezzar would, wouldn't just take a portion of his food. He would take the whole feast. He would take his wine, he would take his meat, and he would offer it to his God. And I wrote the name of the God down. His God was Bel Merodach. So Daniel must have thought, if I take this food, I'm going to tolerate idolatry. I'd be breaking the law of Moses, and I would make myself unclean. And here's what, here's what I believe. I believe Daniel looked over everything. He looked at that Ruth Chris quality $500 plate. Man, that looks good but it's unclean, and I don't want to defile my God. You know, temptation looks real good, doesn't it? That plate comes across our table sizzling like a fajita, hallelujah. <laughs> and, man, that looks good. And here's Daniel looking at it, and I believe one of the reasons why Daniel didn't even want it because he didn't want to be tempted with it. You know, I, I, my wife and I were talking. We, we took uh, Dr. Price out. They wanted to go to Bob Evans. I don't, it's okay. I mean, we, we, but we went to Bob Evans, and she was sitting across from me. And, and for those of you who know my struggles, I've given up my, I've given up my potatoes. 
And you know how people say, you know, my love language is doing things for others. My love language is potatoes. Like, I just love potatoes. And she was eating French fries in front of me. Oh, oh. now I love her. I'm not throwing her under the bus. She was, she was brought to help me be stronger in my stand. And she, she, was, she, she helps me. I saved myself? No, I didn't. Okay. But, <laughs> y'all pray for me now. But, um, but the idea is, have you ever tried? Let me, how about this? Let me give a better example where I don't throw my wife under the bus. All right. We, we had the food downstairs. I can't have dessert like that. And I'm seeing plate after plate. And Brother Jeff, man, that was the most dessert I think a human could even, could even look at and nonetheless eat. And I'm sitting there like, man. And you know what? I think Daniel, he knew that if he sat in front of that long enough, it would smell really good to him. And he'd want it. And Daniel removed himself from the temptation, right? Daniel did not want to defile himself. He looked over everything that was going on. He didn't want to tolerate idolatry. And he made a decision not to defile himself. He was not going to break God's word. He was not going to sin against him. But catch this. We talk about Daniel's courage. Do you realize Daniel could have been executed for what he just did? You know how we said it was an honor in the ancient world to eat the food that the king had? Do you realize who was planning the menu when it was given to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel? The king. Can you imagine the slight against a man like Nebuchadnezzar? King, listen, you literally saved these people from death in their minds. They won't even eat. They're better than you. What do you think Nebuchadnezzar would have done to them? So here's here's Nebuchadnezzar's anger, right? And here's Daniel trying to purpose in his heart to do right. The king ordered the menu, and it would have been a great insult, and it could lead to severe punishment. Now you say, well, what kind of punishment could Nebuchadnezzar do? Can I give you all a quick Bible lesson? How many of you all remember the story of what uh, Nebuchadnezzar did to King Zedekiah? Anybody? King Zedekiah rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And when they fleed the city, you know what he did? He found them. He encircled them. He killed the guy's sons and then put out the guy's eyes. So the very last thing that this poor man saw was the death of his children. You know what? If you read in the book of Jeremiah, you know what they would also do to Israelites? They would cook them over, over a fire. That, when I'm talking about Nebuchadnezzar, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you. A wicked, vile, disgusting, like 50,000 times worse than Hitler. I'm talking about an evil man. So here's Daniel in the sight of all of this evil and in, in the, the pressure that you might be executed that same way. And him saying, you know what? Honoring God is more important. I don't want to sin against my God. And may I say, no matter the consequences, no matter the consequences, here's the courage of Daniel. I've made up my mind. No matter the peer pressure, no matter the punishment, I'm not going to turn my back on God. You know, you can change my name. You can't change my nature. I wonder if Daniel thought in his mind when they gave him that new name, you can call me whatever you want. I'm still a Jew. Right? You can regard me any way you want, but I will not sin against my God. Daniel purposed in his heart because God was more important than the peer pressure of man, and he would not back down. I wrote this down. We need more Daniels today. People that won't just float along the current of the world, going with everyone else, but row hard against it. You know, this world is, is very accommodating to everybody except if you believe in Christianity, it seems. And it's, it's, you can have your religion. Go to church, do your worship, do these things, but don't take it out of the church house. Don't live what you speak. You know, you can do what you want. You can, you can, you can sin against your God, but I think we need some Daniels that'll say, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to serve him. When the devil pushes the plate across our table, that temptation, we must turn from it and not turn or sin against our God. I'm going to give you a principle. Don't wait for something big before you decide to serve God. Don't wait for something big. Don't wait for the fiery furnace before you decide you're going to serve Jesus. Don't wait until, do you believe in God or I'm going to kill you, before you decide that you're not going to sin against your God. Don't wait. Don't wait. Purpose in your heart that you'll obey God in the little things. Because God often uses little things to prepare us for big things later. You know, we studied this morning about... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You remember that? For those of us who are 
cognitive right now, right? For, we, we remember studying them, and, and we see that they stood at a big time. But, you know, when I read that story, I don't think that day there was any inner battle in their hearts. I don't think that they said, should we? Shouldn't we? Well, hold on. There's a lot of peer pressure. Well, hold on. I could lose my. I could lose all my benefits. I, I could lose this this position I have in government. You know what? I believe the decision had already been made back at the king's table. You know, it's a, it's a lot easier to stand if you've already made up your mind in the, in, before the the occasion comes up. You know, if people know the answer is no, there's really as as the as as the three young Hebrew says, it's not needful for us really to answer you. You know. We made a decision back then that hasn't changed, right? We, we've decided that we're going to do right. We've decided that we're going to honor the Lord. That hasn't changed. I don't need to give you a defense of why I don't do wrong because, listen, I've decided all the way back here that God is my king, not you. Well, what about the peer pressure? Who cares? God is watching me. What about what people think about you? I only care what God thinks about me. I will not sin against my God. Daniel purposed in his heart. It took great faith, no inner battle. They already had made their decision at the king's table. And I wrote this down. Purposing is really like planning your feet and saying no. Have you ever met somebody who just will not give an inch on something? Righteously. We all know people who won't give an inch on anything else. But I'm talking about we don't do that. We don't do this. Why? I just don't want to sin against my God. Well, that's weird. Well, sorry. I, I really just care what God thinks, right? That is purposing. That's the type of courage that Daniel had. You know, I wrote this down, um, <clears throat> and I think this is kind of interesting. Uh, you, you, look, you look at Daniel's life, right? How could he be so constant? Why was he the man who was regarded as he was? Because he was a man of character, a man of character. We need people who will just listen. I think nowadays it seems like it, it, Christianity has always been a byword. It's always been a curse word. It seems like with people who don't know God. But listen, Christianity is something that we live. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And listen, if people think you're weird for not doing wrong, that's their problem. That ain't your problem. Purpose in your heart that, listen, I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to sin against my God. Well, you'll be, you'll be mocked. You'll be lambasted. People think you're stupid. Who cares? Don't sin against your God. Purpose in your heart that you are going to do right no matter the consequences. And may I say, no matter if anybody stands with you either. Stand alone if you need to. Number two, Daniel purposed, I will not lose my testimony. Daniel purposed, I will not lose my testimony. Look at verse number nine. I read it for a reason. After Daniel purposed in his heart, look at this. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. You know what? I believe Daniel had already st started developing a testimony with his captors. I believe Daniel was a, was a gracious person. I believe that God blessed him for it. You know, Proverbs 16, 17 says this. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know what I believe? Daniel was living such a life that pleased God that God took him in a very, a very rough environment and started promoting him and giving him favor. You say, well, are there any other examples in the Bible? Sure. What about uh, Joseph with Potiphar? What about Joseph with the jailer? What about Joseph with Pharaoh, right? There's plenty of examples of God giving favor when our ways please him. And I believe Daniel had started to develop a testimony with his captors. I believe Daniel lived such a separated godly life that those around him took to him. Daniel was seen as an Israelite indeed, one who loved God and knew how to pray. Daniel had a testimony with the lost people around him. Daniel, I believe, was friendly. I believe he was lukewarm, but he, you know what? He was a testimony. Can I, can I help you with something? You can take a stand without being a jerk. You know, people ask me, you know, are, are you a Christian? Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not mad about it. <laughs> right? I'm happy. You know, God has changed my life. He's given me peace. He's forgiven of my sins. And he's just asked me to give my reasonable service. It's not a big, you know, I, I'm not angry about it. But if you ask me about it, I'm going to talk to you about it. Right? You don't need to be angry with your, with, with your separation. I, I believe Daniel was, was, was warm to those around him, but he kept his testimony. And I believe he thought, if I do like the Babylonians, then everything I've built with this prince will vanish in a moment. 
that prince of the eunuchs, that lost man, will see me eat and think, Daniel is just like me. What's the difference? He lives like me. Why do I need his God? And my testimony is gone. Think about that. Here's Daniel. He's in a foreign land trying to stand for his God. And people around him start noticing there's something different about Daniel. And they, they, they did notice that, right? But if Daniel, I think in his mind, says, but if I eat, I'm at the same table with all those people that agree that Jehovah isn't God of God. And I just can't. I can't defile myself. I'm already building a testimony for my God. I don't want to turn from that. Can I tell you, friends, you can live your life circumspectly, and we need to be circumspect. We need to look over our lives, live carefully, live holy. But you can live 30 years of a perfect testimony and lose it in three seconds. And I believe Daniel, that plate gets put across his table, and he's looking at it, and he's smelling it. I mean, it's quality meat. It's quality drink, and he's hungry. He's a teenage boy, and it seems like teenagers, teenage boys especially, there's a hole in their leg where they stock the excess food. They just keep eating. So here's this young, hungry, growing boy looking at this awesome, like, steak and probably eight kinds of meat, and I just know if I eat it, oh, Daniel's one of us. Everything I, everything Daniel says from now on, but you eat the same plate we eat. What's different about you? You know, that meat, Daniel, was offered to idols. Oh, you knew that? Oh, great. You know, so Daniel was, I believe, he was really concerned about losing his testimony. One second can ruin years of a well-lived witness. Can, can I tell you a sad story? And this is true. This is not preacher talk where it's like, you know, uh, a light from heaven started speaking to me. But no, this is a true story. Years ago, I had a, a friend of mine. We, we, you know, as, as time goes on, we lost contact. That's very common. But <clears throat> he was telling me of a story of a mutual friend of ours. Guy was saved, grew up in the same youth group I did, but he really turned from the faith. He really went his way. He, he basically lived that hard partying lifestyle. And the way he looked, I mean, it was just his appearance. He wasn't mad about it. He was just, that's who he was. But he and my friend were outside and they were talking. And they got, they, this guy came across their path and all of a sudden they got in a spiritual conversation. And my mutual friend, our mutual friend and my friend started basically tag teaming, right? They started talking to the guy about the faith. And then all of a sudden, that guy stopped, disgusted, and looked at our mutual friend and said, hold on a second. Why do I even have to listen to you? You look just like me. He looked like he, he had basically gone to every party in town and he was living this life that, that there, was no, there was no difference in his life. And that person said, hold on a second. Your words don't match your mouth. God help us. God help us to live such a life where people say we line up with the word. Our lives are different. Our homes are different. Our relationships are different. Our speech is different. Our path is different because we're different. God help us not to lose our testimony for a joke, for communion with those who, who are looking at us. Let there be a difference. Don't eat of the plate, if you will. Don't lose your testimony. Can I give you a hard lesson I've learned? And many times people get angry when I say this. But here's a principle. The lost world knows what a Christian should be. Sometimes more than we do. And I've experienced a lot of people who don't believe in Jesus who've also said something like this. And I believe it. The lost world has a higher standard for those who follow Christ than we have for ourselves. And, I, and here's what I believe. I believe if Daniel, in his heart, sat down at that table and partook with everyone else, he would lose everything that he stood for. Here's how dedicated Daniel was. I'd rather eat salad and drink water for three years than blaspheme my God. Listen, I've, I've started this new diet, and you know my trials and tribula tribulations. I ate salad for a week, and I, I, was, I was ready to be done with it forever. I, I like it, but not every day, right? Can you imagine eating just salad? Uh, some of you can, but for me, I can't imagine eating salad for three years. But here's Daniel. I'll, I'll, listen, and here's the idea. I'll make the sacrifice as long as I keep my testimony. And can I tell you, sometimes if we can put it into everyday uh, life, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's 
not um, doesn't work well with our schedules. Sometimes it costs us something to live holy. But here's what I believe Daniel would say. It's worth it. Because you may not know it, but people are watching us, and you have a testimony with somebody in your circle. How are you living? Are we living circumspectly? God, help us live with those, uh, live with the idea that those around us are seeing you. Have purpose in your heart to be the Christian that God saved you to be, and don't let your life shut up your mouth. If there's someone here who has blown their testimony, go to the person you've, you've blown that with and apologize. Get Christ's name out of the mud and tell them you've not lived right, you're sorry, and you've purposed to follow Jesus. Can I tell you, nine out of ten times, the person that you go to and say, listen, I'm a Christian, I've not been living right, but I've dedicated my life to Christ. I'm sorry for the testimony I've been. I've not been the Christian I should be. I'm, I'm just like all the people that you rail against. I'm sorry. Nine out of ten times, people are going to respect you for owning up to that. I believe that. And if you're sitting here tonight thinking about doing something that wouldn't honor Christ, stop. Plant your feet in righteousness and say, this thing is not worth my testimony. Purpose in your heart. Number one, that you will not sin against your God. But number two, that you won't lose the testimony that you built up. That thing that you want to do that goes against God, that thing that you're, you're, you're meditating on and you're letting it consume you, and hopefully no one in here is doing that, but if that ever comes across your mind, don't ruin your testimony. God, help us. And then lastly, number three, and we're done. Lastly, I believe Daniel purposed, I will be an influence. I will be an influence. You know what's interesting? When you study the Bible, 10,000, catch this, 10,000 people were taken captive. Remember what we talked about? Who knows how many dozens or hundreds of those skilled, able, smarty pants young kids were put into that governmental training program. But I've read this story a couple times. I don't see anybody else standing up. You ever notice that? I don't see Jochebed saying anything. I don't see Samuel saying anything or whoever, what their names were. No one else was standing up. No one else is taking a stand. And you know what? You say, well, out of all those people, why didn't somebody else stand up? Why did it have to be a Daniel? You know, I was studying this, and here's what I believe. I believe those young people were looking at the opportunity of money and position. They didn't want to be seen as difficult or uncooperative with their bosses because for one reason, it would spoil their chances of advancement. And that attitude has permeated many a church. Well, preacher, I'm, I'm happy to live as a Christian on Monday, but I can't be a Christian at work. That'll affect how everybody sees me. And I, I want to be just one of everybody. I don't want to be that person that sticks out. I don't want to be that person who's a Christ follower. I don't want to be that person who says, oh, you got to get saved. I don't want my life to affect me negatively. But I believe Daniel didn't care. Daniel didn't mind being that weird religious guy who didn't, who didn't care if his uh, workers thought that he was odd. Daniel was going to stand. Daniel was going to be an influence. And he knew it would cost him something to be a leader. You know what? Daniel knew he'd be mocked. You ever been mocked for taking a stand for something? Daniel knew that they would spread rumors. Daniel knew that they would talk behind his back. Daniel knew that they would, you know, roll their eyes at him and, and besmirch him and all of these things. But here's what I think Daniel said. I don't care. I'm going to be an influence. Now, this gets preached to teenagers since probably, you know, the, the King James Version has been translated in English, right? So it's been, it's, this sermon's probably been preached since the 1600s. But here, let me apply it. This isn't just for teenagers. You hear it at youth conferences. Teenagers, stand for God. Teenager, be a testimony. Let me encourage the church. Be a testimony. Stand for God. Be a leader where you are. Amen. Stand if nobody else does. I'm going to lead. You want to know why? Because there are a lot of people looking for peace. There are a lot of people looking for forgiveness. There's a lot of people looking for something real. Amen. And you get to be that person to say, I've been changed. I'm different. Why? Because of the change of my heart. I'm going to be a leader. Who cares? I've got what the world is looking for. God, help us to be the influence no matter what, no matter the mocking. Stand, a purpose in your heart. And may I say what an effect he had on his three friends. He influenced them so much that when their trial came, they had a pattern to follow. They had a godly influence to encourage them. I wrote a couple of things, a couple of questions for us. Are we being an influence for Christ? 
or just following the crowd? Are we dragged down with our friendships or do they strengthen our walk for Christ? Do they increase our appetite for the things of the world? We must be a leader, not go with the flow, be an influence, invest in others. Can I just give you a personal testimony? You say, well, why are you preaching on this? Why is it so passionate? Why is it such a passionate thing to you? I would not be here if somebody, if somebody had not decided to be an influence on me. Somebody that I could look to and they would say, we don't do that. This is wrong. And somebody that was, had enough backbone to say, Peter, this is what a Christian should be. We all have people that have influenced us, correct? We must carry on the tradition of teaching others also. Purpose in your heart that you are going to be an influence in whatever circle you lie. So as we close today, here's the challenge. Dare to be a Daniel. Purpose in your heart. Purpose you will not sin against your God. Purpose you will not lose your testimony. And purpose... You will be an influence. Catch this. No matter the cost. Here's a young man. He could be 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, who had enough unction to say, you know what? I could die. I don't care. You know what? They could, they could cut off my meals completely. I could starve to death. I don't care. People could laugh at me. I don't care. You want to know why? Because I will not sin against my God. Number two, I'm not going to lose my testimony. Who cares if they laugh at me? I'm not losing my testimony. God is real to me, and God's changed my life. And number three, no matter if they stand or not, I'm still going to be an influence. Let me encourage you. I don't know where you are in your Christian life. I hope you are lively and standing for Christ, and you are a beacon, and you are a city upon a hill. You're salt and light and all of those things. I hope that's what you are. But maybe today we look over at our lives, and maybe our lives haven't been as Daniel was, purposed. Let me encourage you, make the decision now. I purpose in my heart, I'm going to do right. I'm going to honor Christ. I'm going to be a testimony. And I am going to influence others, even if they mock me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Hi, this is Pastor Ryan. I want to thank you for taking time to watch our video. And I really hope it was a blessing to you. Uh, if you found that it was a blessing, please do us a favor and share this video with your friends. And uh, if you are in the Newcastle, Indiana area, and you're looking for a church, or you're not involved in a church, and you would like to come check us out, I want to just personally invite you to do so, okay? I want to thank you for all of your time today, and I want to say God bless you. Thank you.